you both work with companies across a range of sectors. Can you each highlight one or two industries that you think are really leading the way in terms of turning AI integration into revenue? Vivek, let's start with you. Sure, thanks, Ellie. Good evening, everyone. My name is Vivek. I'm based in Melbourne, Australia, and I run our uh, Accenture's regional business for data and AI. Uh, I think the key sectors where we're seeing uh, you know, uh, business leaders adopt what we call uh, you know, strategic bets Mm -hmm. uh, include areas like banking, insurance, health. Those three would be the top uh, three sectors where we see a lot of action. Uh, okay, Dipanjan. You're kind of similar. There are four industries where we see a lot of uh, traction. One is financial services, including banking and insurance, healthcare, retail, and manufacturing. There is a lot of actually work in manufacturing where they're using both generative and predictive AI. And are there any industries that are encountering specific challenges, do you think? Uh, look, I think uh, surprisingly, the industries which are more regulated are actually using it a lot. You know, contrary to what uh, I think uh, you would feel, uh, actually, if you see whether it's health, it's regulated, financial services regulated. I think it's mostly uh, manufacturing industries, mm -hmm. uh, which are, uh, if you think about the spectrum of AI, you know, classical AI, which is in terms of, you know, let's say predictive, prescriptive modeling, has been around for a while. I think as we kind of start to join generative AI to it, uh, we see, for example, manufacturing companies taking a little bit different uh, approach, uh, taking time to be able to you know, get in, but we are already seeing some initial leaders in that sector as and well. And when you say taking a different approach, what are they doing that's different? Sure, you know, the kind, uh, the context is a little bit different. Uh, asset heavy industries have different types of business uh, conditions in which they need to work. Uh, if you think about to get maximum value out of AI, you've got to get your data sets ready. Uh, and for asset intensive industries, the data sets could be very specific to the type of instrumentation they use, mm -hmm. which is not the same as, let's say, financial services, for example. Okay. So I think those would be the kind of thought process which uh, some of the clients we work with are going through. Mm -hmm. Zabantan, if you're looking at kind of your portfolio of, of clients, can you outline some of the specific obstacles that you think exist to unlocking the bottom line, as, as this session is called? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I actually see uh, three gaps, which okay. I think uh, our customers are kind of uh, dealing with. One I call the value gap, right? There are, you know, a lot of excitement about AI, but translating that into business outcome is not easy for various different reasons. Sometimes there are not enough um, tools and platforms that people can use. Sometimes they don't have the data. Sometimes mapping the business problem into an AI problem is not easy for people. The second thing that I see, I call it confidence gap. There are a lot of people who are kicking the tires. They are doing prototyping, but they're not confident enough to take those uh, applications, AI applications or models to production because they're not sure about the accuracy of it. They're not sure about the safety and other risks that associated with those models are. And third, of course, is uh, the expertise gap, right? I mean, this is kind of a huge area of focus for a lot of people. Uh, there are not too many people who actually know how to build, for example, foundational models, mm -hmm. right? But luckily, you don't need that many people to build foundational models. What you really need people who can use these models to actually solve business problems. Even that, I think, requires a lot of expertise and training. Other thing that I think is also going to happen, people are worried about, it's the dual of this, that AI is going to disrupt the skill mix in an enterprise, and people are worried about how, what impact it's going to have, for example, you know, uh, various different jobs that people do today, what is going to happen to those jobs, and there are new jobs which are going to be created by AI which requires also skilling up the workforce. So what would be your advice to someone, a young person who's thinking about what to study at university? They want to thrive in this new AI landscape. What should they be doing? What well, should they I mean, be studying? You know, I have one of those at home. My son just graduated high school and is a computer science major in uh, UC, uh, University of California. And he's kind of a little bit worried what is going to happen to the coding jobs, right? Okay. Because, you know, there are a lot of coding jobs which I think these AI co-pilots are going to do. But I do think it's also going to create new types of job. And where I think it's going to be probably most lucrative and productive in terms of skilling up is that when you can marry the AI skill with, for example, a specific domain-specific skill. Right? For example, if you are an expert in biology, 
how to apply AI to do new medicines or personalized medicine would be a huge thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, some of the other areas, for example, education, I do think personalized education will be a big thing. So how do you use AI to create those new industries, new use cases, new businesses? That's where I think going to be the most action, and that's what people need to learn. So that's what people should be thinking about as, think they, so. as they map out their, their, their careers. Um, I'm interested in the confidence gap that you described and the expertise gap. Vivek, is that something that you've, that you've witnessed as well? And if so, are there any demographic specifics to that? Is, it, is, the, is the confidence gap more prevalent in some parts of the world than others? Is it women rather than men? Are there any specifics <laughs> around, around those factors? Go ahead, do you want to take this? Thanks. Uh, uh, I think, uh, look, uh, the, we are going through a large pivotal moment. Uh, I think not having the right talent in the right places is a challenge which every business is facing right now. Mm -hmm. We just can't find enough, uh, you know, uh, uh, talent to go about uh, doing what we call reinventions, thinking end to end. How do you really not apply this incrementally, but actually reinvent examples? You know, we worked uh, uh, maybe a little bit sidetracked, but we worked with a food and beverages company mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, you know, globally. And there, by using an AI-driven solution for marketing content generation, mm -hmm. we could actually build one year equal worth of content in about eight days. And that is phenomenal in terms of productivity enhancements. But at the center of it is, how do you actually transform your workforce? Yeah. To be able to really scale this, one needs to think beyond use cases to business capability. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you think about a product launch versus a photo shoot in which you can kind of apply something and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think in terms of the question you asked, I think talent uh, is difficult to find. Uh, companies have to think about what does it mean from a workforce transformation perspective. At Accenture, we specifically have worked a lot on what we call what the future of work is gonna be, starting from there, to be able to kind of think through. So if that is the future of work, what is the type of workforce you need, mm -hmm. and then be able to define which type of workers with what skill sets are needed, mm -hmm. and have structured curriculums on how do you actually transform the workforce. That kind of becomes quite key. Uh, and I can uh, assure you today, I mean, we are uh, trying to get talent in every market we operate in. Talent is limited. So it's a combination of getting the right set of basic capabilities and training them, mm -hmm. internally in your firm, actually moving people. I mean, conventional data versus modern data is a big area, for example, mm -hmm. because if you don't get your data right, how do you kind of really unlock value from AI and so on and so forth? So hopefully that gives some ideas. So in terms of confidence gap, I, I think it depends on the risk level of the use cases that you are addressing, right? I think, you know, uh, the EU AI Act actually has done a pretty good job in defining those risk levels. There are use cases where you probably should never use AI, right? For example, social justice and things like that. And there are use cases which are high risk, there are use cases that are moderate risk, there are use cases which are low risk. And it depends on the regulation that people have. And, you know, one of the things I tell people that, uh, the CIOs, when you talk to them, they are concerned about three things, that can AI create top-line growth, can AI save cost, mm -hmm. and how do I stay out of jail? And stay out of jail is where the confidence comes into play. And if you talk to the CIOs of regulated industries, that's where they are most worried about, because mm -hmm. it can not only create business risk, it can create reputational risk, sometimes mm -hmm. it can create many other type of risk, they can be on the wrong side of the law, for example. Mm -hmm. So what's your advice to the leaders in this room on bridging that confidence gap, getting to the other side of it? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the first thing to do is to define the risk profile of the use cases that you're working on. And depending on the risk profile, there are different steps that you take. For example, what kind of testing you need to do, what kind of disclosures you need to have, what kind of moderation you need to apply to the results produced by AI, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think through that in a systematic way, I think you can take uh, care of the risk and you know, figure out where you can take it to production and what actions you need to take if things go wrong. I'm gonna open it up to the floor for questions in a minute. Um, I've just got a couple more for you both. Um, Debanjan, you've been at Data Robot as CEO for about 18 months now, I, I believe. About, about Is that about it? Yeah. Um, and when you started, the company was, it was in a bit of a rough spot. That I think there'd just been quite a few layoffs, but you've really executed a turnaround. There's a new platform, 9.0. Um, you're rolling out various integrations. Can you talk to us a bit about the role that AI has played in that turnaround internally? Well, I mean, you know, when I joined Data Robot, um, 
generative AI kind of was not the thing, right? So generative AI happened. I remember I was actually in a Morgan Stanley conference in San Francisco, and everybody asked me about generative AI, and the way back, the Uber driver quizzed me for half an hour on generative AI. I knew that generative AI has arrived. And so generative AI has played really a big you know, part in turning around the company because there is so much of opportunity that I see with generative AI. And what we have also done, we have been in the AI business for a long time. We have mm -hmm. been a pure AI company for about you know, 12 years. But some of the things that we developed for predictive AI applies quite well to generative AI, especially when it comes to governance and observability and things like that. Mm -hmm. And what I have seen is that is the combination of predictive and generative AI, the intersection of that, you find the most value-added use cases for businesses, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I think of this in terms of the left brain and the right brain. The left brain is your analytic part, the predictive AI, and the right brain is your communicative part. And when you put the two together, that's when you get the iPhone moment of AI, which is what has happened. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, go ahead. Um, Vivek, a question for you. So Accenture has committed, I think, $3 billion mm -hmm. yep. um, to AI. Um, how are you going to ensure that that investment changes the way that you interact with your clients in a positive way, maybe accelerates the process, but you also maintain that high touch human element that Accenture is so well known for. What's the balance there? Sure, and thanks for going there. I think it's a very committed investment from Accenture. Our CEO kind of announced that in 2023. Uh, I think the key parts to that was how do we kind of really work with the industry and shape the industry's future? Part of that was how do we build industry specific solutions, functional specific solutions, uh, build a network of what we call uh, you know, uh, Gen AI studios across the globe, be able to really uh, help our clients uh, see what's the latest uh, across the globe when they come to such a center. Uh, the other part was uh, you know, uh, training of mm -hmm. our own workforce, uh, trying to kind of do that. So largely, how do we uh, keep uh, humans at the, at the center of this? Uh, if you look at most of the research, Accenture has published quite a bit, about half of the benefits come from automation. Uh, to the Bunjan's point, as you go from classical AI, uh, which was all about data, to generative AI, which is so much about language, when you put it together, what you can do in terms of automation, like you know, autonomous processes at scale, is amazing. Uh, however, you know, as you kind of uh, go towards uh, you know, uh, putting this together, rest half of the benefits are what we call augmentation based. So you've got to start thinking not incrementally around processes, but you need to start thinking reinvention. How do you actually start to think in a new way how you would do customer care? And it's very, very different than looking at how you're doing it today mm -hmm. versus how would you want to do in the future. Mm -hmm. For doing augmentation, you've got to start with putting humans at the center. Thinking about in this new world, uh, what is the role which uh, machine plays to kind of really support humans and still get to benefits. And the benefits are not just automation, productivity benefits. The real benefits are around outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, having different types of work, which is more interesting. Uh, getting to what we call a 10x impact in clients' businesses mm -hmm. and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. So I would think that's how we're looking at how do we put humans at the center at of the center of it. One quick question before I open it up to Banjan. You mentioned before the iPhone moment for AI. I'd love to know from both of you what would be your personal iPhone moment for AI, maybe it's happened, but maybe it hasn't. What would that look like for you? That light bulb, massive light bulb moment that changes everything. Well, I mean, you know, it is when AI becomes pervasive in everything that we do, right? Um, and I don't know if I'll call it iPhone moment, but this is an example use case which kind of fascinated me for a while. Uh, so we have customers who use classical AI to do various different kinds of forecasting. We have a grocery store customer. They own a lot of grocery stores in the US. And they use our models to predict, for example, how many mangoes they need to order in a particular store in California, mm -hmm. right? And they have been doing that for every product in every store, sometime various different days have different models, and they have thousands of those models. And what they have done with Generative AI, and which was quite fascinating, now they figure out how many excess mangoes they are going to have in a particular store, and they are creating personalized coupons that they are sending out to people that they know. They are also creating, for example, very, very localized radio ads that they are putting in various different radio stations. For example, if they know that Indians like 
you know, uh, ripe mangoes and Mexicans like green mangoes, they will put a Hindi language ad in a local news station. Mm -hmm. And they are doing all of this thing automatically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, pretty much everything that we do probably can be made more intelligent with use of AI. And it's mm -hmm. when it becomes pervasive and invisible, that's when you know that iPhone moment will happen. Mm -hmm. So no leftover mangoes. Um, Vivek? Yeah, that's well, very interesting. It's, it's super interesting. Uh, look, I would kind of want to say that maybe last year, it was mostly about experimentation when we worked with businesses. But this year, we are seeing businesses really put their heads together to be able to scale. Okay. To be able to scale, you need to think about you know, the competencies across. Having a large language model is a small part of that, which you use for doing whatever. There are normally seven things. We see leaders who do this well kind of bring a lot of things together to be able to scale this up. Mm -hmm. So think about being on cloud. That could be one thing. Second is getting your data ready, which we spoke about. Uh, third, think about the enterprise-grade AI solution. That's not just about the model. On the model, you have adaptation. On top of adaptation, you have consumption. So you've got to put that thing together, uh, which becomes important. You also want to integrate that with your uh, you know, digital platforms, like your enterprise, the ERP platforms, the marketing platforms, the sales platform. So there are a lot of these things which come together to be truly be able to unlock the value mm -hmm. and be able to scale up. And I think that's, to me, is where we're seeing a big difference from last year to this year. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Vivek and Abanjan? If so, raise your hand. If not, I will continue with one last question. I, I want to finish on the subject of timelines. So you've just out, laid out multiple steps, Vivek. Um, if a, if a client comes to you and says, hey, we're about to invest a ton of money now in AI, this is our priority going forward, what's a realistic timeline for them to see meaningful returns? Sure, and, and let me take uh, examples, right? Uh, I think in the press, uh, uh, Accenture and National Australia Bank recently announced the journey we've been on with them for about one and a half years now. Uh, through this process, they focused on how to reinvent uh, uh, using uh, AI, generative AI, specifically in uh, customer service and operational efficiencies. Mm -hmm. uh, think about 20 odd use cases with about eight of them being enterprise grade level. So that's about one and a half years. What I want to say is, uh, I think the key thing is, it is a multi-year journey. Multi-year, okay. Right, if you're thinking about reinvention, my uh, you know, encouragement to leaders I work with is to think beyond use cases. To be able to go at scale, you've got to move from use cases to business capability. Mm -hmm. And that takes time. That takes a lot of thinking. I would highly encourage all of us not to kind of really get bogged down by incrementally changing the process. Uh, investing in your own workforce mm -hmm. is going to be very important. And then thinking through all these seven components we spoke about. Mm -hmm. But really, it is a multi-year journey. Uh, you know, you've got to put, uh, be thinking, how do you not kind of do incremental changes to what you're doing today to be able to. And do one it. final tip for the people in this room, if they're, you know, they're in companies that they want to really unlock, as we said, the bottom line going forward, what's the one thing they should go into their offices tomorrow and start thinking about? Well, I, I think, I, I do think use cases and returning value to business is important. I mean, you know, for Gen AI, we are in the honeymoon period and that's not going to last very long. Right? So it is important to pick the use cases which show near-term value, but also have a long-term plan so mm -hmm. that you can show the value at scale, which I think is going to happen. Mm -hmm. But showing near-term value and showing some return on investment, showing some early successes, I think is very, very important. One final bit of advice, Vivek? Uh, pretty similar. I think lead with value. That's lead what we do with all clients. Yeah. You've got to be really knowing what you're solving for from a business perspective. This is not a tech for tech. After decades of technology life cycle, you have something where the technology is adapt adapting to how humans work. Mm -hmm. I think it's an exciting era. Uh, if approached correctly, there is so much uh, to be done in terms of unlocking value. Vivek and Devanjan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for